before I tell you mine, let's look at the bigger picture about the food and drink industry. In an era of cuts in public sector and in many, many parts of the industry, there is a fear about stagnation and lack of investment. Luckily, the food and drink industry is one of the few parts of British manufacturing that goes on growing. The reasons are simple. Among them, people need to eat. Whatever the economy does, in our case, eating out becomes less and eating in becomes far more. For example, people would prefer to go to supermarkets, buy the product in and eat in because we are providing, if not better, equal quality, high quality food at extremely good value for money. I think I've done my seven. Now let me turn that clock back. When I arrived here from India in 1975 with my husband Ali, a medical doctor, and my son Sadi, I was disappointed with non-existence of Indian food on offer. Or at least where I was living at that time, North Wales. Beautiful, but barely any Indian ingredients. It wasn't just that there were no ready meals on offer. I couldn't even buy my Hindi, my Bangan, my Okra, and Chili, and Nadia. None of those was available. The shopping experience was not as exotic as it is now today. Thanks to supermarkets. They've done a incredible job. Traveling from North Wales to London or Manchester to buy spices and ingredients wasn't very convenient, but it was necessary. See, you have to remember, that in 1970s or 80s, this country wasn't really busting into country genius like it is now. The Anglo Indian food in the shop was amongst the worst offenders. It was bland, it was tasteless, nothing <coughs> like the real food that I'm really proud of. Beside potatoes, cauliflower, and peas, there was hardly any other vegetables available and one can only eat so many peas in a day. Missing my family was hard enough. But missing my ingredients, basic ingredients, was just too much to cope with. So how did SNA Foods begin? Well, in 1986, having settled in Derby with my family, where my husband joined the general practice, my sons went to Repton local school. They used to come home 9 o'clock in the evening which meant I had lots and lots of time in my hands. So I began wandering around, looking at supermarkets, doing a bit of research. And one day, I saw samosas. Big, in supermarkets. I bought a few, I tasted them, we tasted them, but we couldn't eat them. They were de definitely did not taste Indian. It was bland, tasteless, and boring. And obviously, my dishes are much better, but nothing like my mom, who's absolutely the best food. So that sparked the idea. I had a clear purpose and a clear vision, which was to create delicious food that would excite and delight the nation. So I started making samosas in my own kitchen at home, based on the recipes that I was have grown up with. I started with half a dozen of veg, half a dozen of beef samosas, took it to a local takeaway and said, free of charge, put it on your shelf and see if it will sell. Surprise, surprise, it started selling. So you can guess the investment I made and the risk I took. Two pounds fifty. I started having repeat orders, orders were growing, so I made an appointment to see a distributor because I felt confident that my food was good and not for people to buy. So I made several items and I really presented them well, but there was a hiccup. The distributor wanted me to supply onion parties, which I had never seen, never cooked, never eaten in my life. But we entrepreneurs like challenges. And there is nothing that we can't do. 
so I identify as short. Because if you don't try, you never know. And great Mahatma Gandhi said, you may never know what results of your activities, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. So how do I begin with? That was a very big question. So I asked the customer if he could lend me a couple of parties. He gave me a couple of boxes. I have never eaten so many parties in my life. So I started making them. So I took some flowers, some onions, put them together, mixed it. All right, it going to be easy, but it wasn't. I did more flour, and more flour, and more flour. And it got absolutely wet. And it got bigger, and bigger, and bigger. I started with a golf ball, and ended up with a rugby ball. Burnt outside to grow in the middle. It was a disaster. But I never gave up, and I did cook the bhajis. The volume started creeping up. I was really very proud. We were very pleased with the orders, extending the range. Um, I'm doing very well. I made still everything in my kitchen, a very small kitchen, by the way. And one day when I couldn't cope with the little kitchen, I extended it to my husband's conservatory. I suppose, yes? Conservatory, while he was at the surgery. So when he came back in the evening, he walked in and said, what's cooking? And I was dreading it that he will see that his pots and plants was outside and my rolling pin and my pots and cooker was inside. He came in, he was shocked, he was a very upset man. So I gave him a bhaji to eat. He made him more upset. The route to the supermarket, of, uh, the route that I saw for my product was the supermarket because my vision was to see excited and delighted people nationally, and that was what I wanted to do. So it was time to test my strategy of convincing the supermarket, which is never easy. So I must have made hundreds and hundreds of calls to various retailers. And the retailer who agreed to uh, put my products alongside other uh, competitors on a blind tasting was Asda. And after a couple of weeks, when I thought, right, everything is built out, and I'm not never going to hear from them, I received a call. And the call said they liked my food, it was really good, uh, one of the best, they would like to see me and talk about launching products. And you can imagine, I was so happy. I was jumping with joy, absolutely delighted. But then I soon realized I was still in my kitchen. I had kitchen units, but not the factory units. So very quickly I came down to earth. And I remember my dad saying, keep your eyes on the sky and feet on the ground. So I did come down to the ground. So what do we do? It was a very big question. Do I keep quiet and not tell the truth and they find out? Or do I you know, become honest and open? And I believe that relationships are built on honesty and trust. So I went along and told them the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And you can imagine there was a big silence in that room. And they must have been saying, what have we done? But they appreciated that honesty. And guess what? They agreed to work with us. It was fantastic. So we scrapped together the money to open a small, a very small factory. You may have heard of this. Uh, we were very busy tiling, painting, making cups of tea throughout the night because the buyers were coming to see us 